Hi, everyone. Welcome to the September live event for Essential Vegan Desserts. I'm Frank Costigan, the director of vegan pastry at the wonderful Ruby Online Cooking School and the lead instructor for Essential Vegan Desserts course, which I developed with Chad Sarno and the Ruby team. I love this course and I really love these live events. It gets me with people i know that we're virtual but still especially now it feels really good and i'm very excited about today's topic testing recipes because it's very important and i want to give you as much information as i can i'd like you to share your experience with testing recipes as well and i'm going to get to as many questions as i can First, I want to welcome our guests who are in the courses, all of the courses at the Ruby School, as well as my Essential Vegan Dessert students, graduates, and particularly a warm welcome to the newest group. We had a class start just a few days ago, this week, in fact. If anyone's interested, you can still join the course. There's always a couple of days after it starts where you can join because the Ruby courses are self-paced. And so you, you can do what you need. If you need an extension, we can give you an extension as well. The point is to learn. This course was developed to teach technique. Without technique, you really can't do anything. And that applies to vegan food to plant-based food and to vegan desserts as well. I'm all about technique. Many of you know, if you don't know, I'm going to tell you that I was trained tradition traditionally. I worked in traditional pastry shops and restaurants. I used butter, I used cream, I used eggs, and I changed my diet over 25 years ago because I wasn't feeling well. It turned out I was lactose intolerant, which most people are that is a fact. And I set out to create a vegan, a modern, a more modern vegan pastry kitchen. The choices during that time, which really was the olden days, the dark days of vegan desserts, were very limited. I didn't have the nice variety of plant milks that I can use today. And the sweeteners were, even the sweeteners were very limited in terms of what was available for vegans. Uh, the chocolates were, were like, nobody was really doing bean to bar at the time and so on. So I have, you know, it's just, it's just amazing to see what has happened today. And the way I look at it is vegan desserts done right that are delicious, not just good for what they are. Who wants that? I don't want that. And I hope that you will aspire to fabulousness. We can do it. We can do it, but we have to pay attention. And sometimes, oftentimes that involves some recipe testing. I want to remind my students of a couple of things before we get started. If you haven't joined the Facebook group, Patrick has put the link up in the question queue. So go ahead and grab that link. The Facebook group is for essential vegan desserts only. Each of the Ruby courses has their own private Facebook group. This is a great place to interact with your colleagues who have taken the course or are in the course. People tend to stay because I say, please stay. It's a wonderful place. For example, you're looking for a new mixer or an immersion blender or a brand of vegan butter or something like that, that's a great place to ask for advice or for recommendations. When you have a question about a technical aspect of the course or are having a technical problem, just simply write to support at ruby.com and someone from the team will get back to you there. Um, if you want to talk to me, that's really simple too. Just 
brannettruby.com is what you can do. For people who are currently in the course, or particularly the people who've just started, I want to remind you that this course was developed in a very particular way to build. So going in order will really be helpful. You'll get the most learning there. I mean, if you have a birthday celebration coming up and you wanna jump ahead and make a cake, then go ahead and do that. But otherwise, I really highly recommend that you go in order because we set it up for maximum learning that way. Also remember that when you upload your photos, no one has to be a star photographer, but we want clear photos and not a lot of fancy background. I wanna see things on a white plate so that I can really judge what is going on. And that, I'm gonna leave that there with you all now and remind people that there is, the question queue is on the right side of the screen and you can put a question in. I am going to answer your questions and I may even ask you for a follow-up if I, you know, if I feel that's necessary. So let's have a good time for this next little while. And I will say that some of what I'm going to utter may disappoint some of you, but don't hurt the messenger. This is, I'm giving you the truth. We're going to, I thought it would be really interesting today to use one recipe as a case study in testing. And that is the black bottom cupcakes that are in my cookbook, Vegan Chocolate. And I'll tell you why I picked that recipe. Every recipe that I put out into the public sphere, whether it's on my blog, francostigan.com, or in a cookbook, and cookbook writing means a lot of testing. I never sent a recipe out to my testers until I felt that it was really in good shape. Um, and certainly the recipes in the Essential Vegan Desserts course, the same as all Ruby recipes, are very well tested. So these recipes work. So why would I then go in and take a recipe that already works, that I know works, and try some other ways to make the filling. Well, when I started, again, 25 years ago, there were no commercial egg replacers on the market, nothing. There was an aquafaba in 2013 when I was writing vegan chocolate. So new things are coming along. New doesn't always mean great, but new is coming along. So my cake recipes were developed without the use of commercial egg replacer. I went back, I did some research and historically, there are some cakes that are called accidentally vegan cakes, particularly a chocolate cake. And how were they leavened? Because during the wartime, people didn't have access to eggs and they were rationing their milk so there's water in this particular recipe instead of milk and there are no eggs well baking powder baking soda and vinegar help to leaven this cake and you can find this cake everywhere it's called it's got a lot of different names rose Berenbaum levy who is the the goddess of desserts sent a stack to me that she had gotten that had been sent to her and they were all essentially the same. Non-alkalized cocoa powder, baking powder. I'm Yeah, non-alkalized cocoa powder, sugar, granulated sugar, baking powder, baking soda, and vinegar, white vinegar. Over time, I decided to see if I could make that cake somewhat better. And I did some switching around. I didn't make a whole cake. I divided the recipe in half, and then I divided the recipe by a quarter. So this is what I suggest to you. When you have an idea, don't make a whole big portion. Don't make an eight or nine inch layer. Well, you have to maintain the integrity of the dessert though. It had to have you know, a certain level of batter and so on. So I made a couple of cupcakes to see how it would work. And I was able to, I think, make this cake that was nice, 
very nice, really, but not my favorite chocolate cake, if I'm being honest. Um, it's a, not the chocolate cake to live for, but it's a very good cake. I changed it up some, and I don't remember what I'm calling it, but the changes are on my blog. Again, frankcostigan.com, and it's called the something or other depression cake, probably. So the black bottom cupcakes, I know that we have international students, and I think this is an American recipe, but it is a chocolate cupcake with a filling, a cream cheese filling, and oftentimes in the cream cheese filling are some chocolate chips. And the cake itself, when I was going to veganize this cake, I said, oh, there's really, there might have been one egg in the cake and there might have been none. I really don't remember offhand, but I know that it was a matter of the cream cheese filling. Now I could not have made this recipe when I was just starting to do vegan desserts because there was no vegan cream cheese. But today we have really nice cream cheese available to us. My favorites are Miyoko's Creamery. That's M-I-Y-K. I can't believe I'm trying to spell in my head. Miyoko's Creamery and Kite Hill are two brands of cream cheese that are very good. And there are others that are very nice as well and have been around longer. So I bought the different kinds of cream cheese and I tried the recipe and I didn't find too much of a difference, one cream cheese to the other. To replace the egg in the filling, however, I decided to make a chia gel replacement. So many, of, many people replace eggs with a flax gel. So it's one tablespoon of ground flaxseed, three tablespoons of water. Mostly, some people do other things, you know, other proportions, but pretty much that's it. I prefer using chia, and I use the lighter color chia, the white chia, because I didn't want the filling marred, and it worked beautifully. So there's the recipe. In fact, I have the recipe right here. But I decided this particular day that I would try an egg replacer. I used Bob's Red Mill egg replacer and followed the directions on the box, this much powder, this much water. And I also, because I am in love with aquafaba, which is chickpea water. And for anyone who hasn't heard about the miracle of aquafaba, it's, chick it's the water from cooked chickpeas. And we have a way of working with it in this course that makes it absolutely reliable. We reduce it by about a third. I found that that makes it super reliable and make meringue and all kinds of things, baked Alaska. But it also is an egg replacer. So I did, I lined up separate bowls and I did one as written in my book one with the Bob's Red Mill egg replacer and one with aquafaba. And what happened was the egg replacer worked well, gave a similar result, but a little bit different. And how do I know that? Uh, because it was quite similar. I invited, this is pre-COVID, pre-pandemic. I invited three friends, one vegan, one vegetarian, one traditional palate to come and taste and they get a sheet of paper. I say, I hope you enjoy this. I know you'll enjoy it, but you have to answer these questions. And they had all kinds of different opinions. We have different palettes. The aquafaba was the biggest surprise. The cupcake became almost like a self-frosting cupcake, if you know what I mean. The filling went up and over. So it wasn't bad but it was different. And in the end, I decided to stick with the original. And that's really how I did it. So I'm inviting you all to try this recipe, cut it in half if you want to, do it the way it's written, it works. But that's my process. Now, this particular recipe is made with natural cocoa powder, if I remember correctly. If I were to use Dutch process, which is alkalized, natural is non-alkalized, there would be some problems. There's a way to switch one to the other by adding a bit of baking soda or another 
you know, something else, but you really want to pay attention to all these things. The sweetener in a recipe, if it's granulated, you can try swapping things out. I have, I mean, take a look at this. So this is a bag, an unopened bag of coconut sugar from Bob's Red Mill. Coconut sugar is considered to be a sustainable sweetener for some people. Some people say that this is less of, is better for the glycemic index. I don't really go there because there's also the glycemic load, but some people really like this. I use coconut sugar very often as a brown sugar replacement. It's got that light molasses taste, but you can see, I think you can see, um, I've got it in the bag. It's a dark color. So if you're making a light cake and you want the cake to look have maintained this light color, maybe a vanilla cake, you're probably not going to use coconut sugar. You would be using cane sugar. Now, vegan cane sugar retains a little bit of the molasses that's inherent in the sugar cane. So it's never pure white. Whole cane sugar, which you may see as Rapadora or Sucana, those are two brands, that is the sugar cane with all of the molasses intact. Well, clearly you're going to get more of a molasses taste. It's great in spice cakes. It's nice in chocolate cakes. So you wanna play around. Sometimes I mix my sweeteners. All vegan sugar is, none of it is as refined as white table sugar, supermarket sugar. So even the ones with the finest crystals, the crystal's going to be larger than a white cane sugar crystal. I lightly grind my sugar before I use it. It makes a difference. To me, these are details that really matter. And when it comes to whole cane sugar, I definitely grind it. I do these things ahead. I store them airtight so I don't have to stop and grind four tablespoons of sweetener or something like that. In terms of Replacing dairy, that's really easy today. Most of you are probably aware, whether you're vegan or not, you can't help but notice when you're in the market, any market today, the array of plant milks. Now, many are replaceable, one for the other, depending on what you're making. I, I my personal favorite really is soy milk for baking. It has the most fat, it has the most protein, it works really well. When I'm doing desserts for people and I can't say who has an allergy to this, that, or the other, I make a couple of assumptions. I assume soy avoiders, so I don't use soy milk. I assume nut allergic, so I don't use almond milk or cashew milk. And the milk that I have settled on is oat milk. It's great for baking. Now, my particular favorite brand is Oatly. I also make my own oat milk sometimes, but I like Oatly. I had learned something new this week. I mean, one of the great things about doing this work is there's always something new to learn. So I buy, I think it's called Original Oatly. It's in a blue refrigerated carton. Last week, Maybe, I don't know if I did it by mistake, but I think it was the only thing that was available. I bought a carton that said full fat. I put it in my Nespresso frother because I like a latte in the morning or a cappuccino and it frothed like soy milk. It was so thick. Well, what's full fat? What's the difference? There's a lot more oil in this one. So if you want to make a richer plant milk, you can add oil. Do I think this is gonna make any difference in baking? Not at all. So going forward, I will buy the regular Oatly, not the one with the extra fat because I don't need that. So these are pretty much your categories. You know, it's plant milk is easy to replace with any of the plant milks. Most recipes will say, give you a particular one or say, use your favorite. I don't use a lot of rice milk when I'm making batter-based batter desserts unless I'm replacing water in a recipe because it doesn't have enough protein or fat to do what I want it to do. But all of them are equally fine, absolutely equally fine. 
Replacing eggs, I sent a link to an article to Patrick about egg replacement, and he'll put the link up. So here's the thing. In the course, we really go into egg replacement, all the different ways that you can replace eggs. You have to know what function of the egg you're replacing. The liquid is really easy. The binding is easy. Flavor, not so important. Structure it gets a little bit more difficult, but it's doable. What was interesting to me about this article, and I was in among a number of chefs who were interviewed for this article, was it really talked to me about what I say all the time, which is I can't necessarily give you an exact answer. It depends. You're going to have to do some work. You're going to have to do some testing. So here in this article, it says Costigan's replaces X with this. And another person said, you know, did it a different way. There was some, I'm not going to call it disagreement, but there wasn't agreement. So you have, you have to do some testing. It just affirmed for me how important it is to do this work. And here's the thing. You really can only, when you're, re when you're testing, and I'm assuming that you're being serious about it, I mean, time is valuable and ingredients are costly too. And then there's the frustration factor. I have a rock in my kitchen that says patience, and I look at it and I breathe. Sometimes you get really lucky and the first time is a charm. Oftentimes you go, that was good, but it's not quite there. And maybe I suspect that some of you do recipe testing and you know exactly what I'm talking about. But the way to do this precisely is to change one ingredient at a time. So I'm going to start taking some questions here. Um, and thank you, Patrick, for putting the links up. So Patricia wants to know if I can talk about having a recipe. Is it as simple as dividing each recipe in half? So that, oh, you and your roommate are both in the course. That's great. Thank you. Um, well, it can last a, last a lifetime. I mean, you stay with Ruby forever. <laughs> stay in the course. Stay in the Facebook group. And we'll be, we'll be making things for a really long time, I hope. So I do find that the recipes scale up and down 100%, meaning divide it in half or scale it by eight. That really works. I'm talking about reliable recipes. I'm not talking about some recipe that you get off the internet from someone that you don't know. And then I get an email saying, hey, Fran, I made this, it didn't work. Well, what can I say? It wasn't, I don't know. I don't know the recipe. One of the Ruby graduates, actually a double, she did Plant Pro and Essential Vegan Desserts course, is in Philadelphia, so we became friendly. She is very science-minded. I am not. I am not good at math. Baking has helped me learn things like um, three teaspoons is one tablespoon and, and so on and gram weight and, and like this, but spreadsheets are not my friend. Lauren Smucker is her name and she gifted me with an Excel spreadsheet or a Google sheet, a Google sheet, and it scales things up. You just put in, she's got across the top a half, three quarters times 10 and so on. And it does the calculations. So that's great. Uh, when I was working as a pastry chef at Angelica Kitchen, I would take my coffee cake, which was called the uncoffee cake. I don't know why. Maybe we weren't supposed to be drinking coffee. Um, and I did it times eight, and it was just bigger bowls, you know, dry in one bowl, liquid in another, bigger whisk, and it worked. So you can always hold back a little bit of the liquid, not the oil, for example a little bit of the salt, but basically they do scale up. The word scale here is very important. The difference between these, so this is a dry measuring cup, and we whisk things, we whisk dry ingredients to aerate them because they settle and then overfill and 
level across. That's the way the recipes are written. And that's different unless a recipe says spoon the flour or cocoa or whatever into the flour into the cup and go like this. That's a different weight. And this is very small, but you get the idea that's a liquid measuring cup. I can't recommend these enough. I use small amounts of oil, small amounts of sweeteners, just enough to matter. But I use a scale. So this is my little scale. This is for things that are, you know, maybe a half a teaspoon of baking powder or baking soda, but I have a scale and I'll put a bowl, tear weight back to zero and do this much flour, zero it out, this much, whatever. There you need to really keep track of your own weights. I have lots of charts from when I was doing my book. Uh, I wanted gram weight in the book as well as a half a cup. I wanted the equal amount of gram weight. And people in the business sent me their lists. They were really helpful. Every one of them was a little different. So you keep your own weight chart and you're good to go. So I had something really interesting happen. This is, can you believe it? I got a bag of Bob's Red, no, this is, yeah, Bob's Red Mill whole wheat pastry flour. It's pretty hard to get whole wheat pastry flour these days, I hear. That's the flour I usually use for whole wheat pastry flour. In the meantime, I had found this company called Sunrise Flour Mill, and I bought this flour. This is also whole wheat pastry flour. This is Heritage Whole Wheat milled from organic white Sonora, a soft white wheat. And most of the flour that we use is stone ground when it's organic. The sunrise is not only a heritage wheat, but it's impact ground. And I found that it was completely different. It felt like baby powder. It was amazing. I mean, it was so soft and it weighed very differently. It weighed light. So what did I do? I called up the company and I spoke with one of the owners. That's something you can always do if you have a question is call. And she said, you can't really compare. It's like apples and oranges in terms of one kind of wheat to another. So the first thing I made with it didn't work out because I treated it just like my regular whole wheat pastry flour. And now it is working out because I've made some, you know, adjustments to it. But I adjusted because I knew what my batter was going to look like, and so on. Now, Naomi says, I eat whole food, plant-based, no oil, anything that would improve taste from there. Been reading about the addition of psyllium husk powder. Um, psyllium husk powder is something I've started to use to some degree. I tend to use gums. I use xanthan gum and guar gum actually more than xanthan and psyllium is something that you can do that adds seems to add a little bit more stretch to a cake in terms of not so dense bread without yeast that is a very long conversation um there is a recipe that i have seen for a no yeast very healthy bread that's made with all kinds of seeds and things, and I'm actually going to try it. So I'm gonna look for it, and if you would like, and I, would, I believe it would fit into the whole food plant-based no oil. So if you'd like to send me an email or anybody, or you know what, I'll put it up on my blog when I find it, and I will let everyone know whose recipe it is. I think my kids in LA have made it, and they said it's delicious. It's dense though. Um, Teresa wants to know if I have a chocolate supplier that I can recommend. Now we're talking. <laughs> I love chocolate. You might have figured that out. I use a number of different chocolates. Um, if you haven't done a lot of chocolate tasting, you might think that all 70% would taste the same. All 72, 66, they don't. They're proprietary blends. So there are different tastes. You use the chocolate that tastes good to you right out of the package, but you have to use the percentage that's listed in the recipe in order for the recipe to work as expected. 
Now, once you have made a baseline, and again, this is why you start with a recipe that works before you start doing your own thing, one thing at a time in smaller quantities. Um, if you're using a different percentage, you're going to play around with the amount of non-dairy milk, for example, or other liquid to get it to work. Anytime I make a chocolate ganache, which is a percentage of chocolate, a proportion of chocolate in a certain percentage and a proportion of usually a non-dairy milk. I have done this, I can probably do it with my eyes closed, but every, and I know how it is by, you know, as soon as the chocolate has emulsified with the milk, I know it's gonna be okay. I still do a little test to make sure that it's fine. So that's the particular suppliers that I am using right now are three. Taza, that's T-A-Z-A, -A, and they're in Somerville, Massachusetts. They have, they're known for their Mexican style chocolate, which is rough. The sugar isn't, it's done differently and it's very nice. I use their 70% couverture and I think it's quite reasonable. They sell 3.3 kilogram bags of it. So if you're interested, I can let you know who to reach out to. I also love Valrona and Republica de, Ca de Cacao. Those are wonderful brands and you can get quantity as well. So you can buy quantity and store, but you wanna store your chocolate carefully in a dark, cool place, not in the refrigerator. Here's a question from Sharon. Sharon's interested in developing her own recipes for her blog. What type or amount of change in ingredients or instructions are required to make the recipe your own? That is a great question, Sharon. Thank you for asking it and being so transparent. So here's the thing. My opinion, if you got an idea from someone else's recipe, you name that person. For example, in my first book, uh, it's got a long name, More Great Good Dairy-Free Desserts Naturally, I have a cornbread recipe in that book. It is 100% different from the recipe that gave me the idea to make this cornbread. But it was a man named Frank Akori who was a fellow chef at Angelica Kitchen. And I liked the taste of his cornbread. My recipe wasn't like his at all, but I wrote inspired by Frank Akari. So professional organizations are going to tell you that if you change one or two ingredients and your procedure is different, it's your own. My suggestion is to learn some basic basic recipes in the course. I know Sharon's in the course. Sharon, <laughs> Sharon and I were neighbors when I lived in New York City. I'm in Philly now and used to be one of my, please come over and taste something. And she'd be right there. And she's a really good cook and baker. And then use that as a stepping stone to make your own recipes. So here's an example. Some of you have probably seen the book Cool Beans by Joe Yonan. If you haven't, I can't recommend it highly enough. Joe Yonan is the food editor for the Washington Post, and this is not his first book. This book is gorgeous. He has a recipe in the book for a lime bunt cake with a white bean filling. And when he was writing the book, he actually called and we collaborate. We didn't really collaborate, but we went back and forth. He asked for advice because he wanted to use a white bean filling in this cake. It didn't particularly appeal to me the way he, he wanted to put it in the cake. I think he ended up using it as a filling. His recipe, he wrote in the head note, I really like Fran Costigan's big orange bunt cake, and that was the inspiration for this cake. His recipe is quite different. The base recipe is quite different from my orange cake. They're both bunts. Mine is orange, his is lime juice, but there are a lot of other ingredients in that cake. Still, he pointed that out. But he 
based it on a recipe he liked and he did a lot of testing. So I hope that helps you, Sharon. I hope that helps you. Um, Ruby wants to know what you can substitute for coconut oil in vegan recipes. I don't use a lot of coconut oil. Um, I just don't. But when I do, I use refined coconut oil unless I'm making a, co you know, if I'm making a coconut recipe and I want the flavor, that's another story. My favorite oil for baking is a mild flavored extra virgin olive oil from a company called California Olive Ranch. And it's the everyday oil. It has a very mild flavor. If I'm making an olive, you know, orange olive oil almond cake, which I have that recipe in my cookbook, I want a fruitier oil. Other oils that I like are sunflower and grape seed. So those are the oils that I use in making desserts primarily. They work really well. They work really, really well. And I can't tell too much of a difference. I think sunflower oil has a little bit of a almost a buttery taste but i use just enough oil to give you a nice crumb a nice crumb in your mouth a cake that's not dry a cake that's not too wet but i do find that the best cakes are or the best cakes to me are made with some amount of oil and that's where this little tiny measuring cup comes in because visually you go oh that wasn't very much at all. Um, you can, you know, my breakthrough cake, my chocolate cake to live for, which was Rip Esselstyn's wedding cake. Uh, I make it with a particular amount. I think for a nine inch cake, there's probably four tablespoons of oil. That's not very much for a cake that will serve 10 people. But I also have an oil free version. Obviously, if I was making it for the Esselstyn family, I did an oil free version. And I have a gluten free version as well. They're all a little bit different. Once you start taking the oil out, you know, there are substitutes. But again, you have to do some playing around with that. So I hope that that helps Ruby. Lori wants to know if I can address gluten-free subs. Well, definitely, and I'm not surprised that I'm being asked about gluten-free. So the, where is it? The flour, the gluten-free flour mix that I use most regularly, <laughs> you see my, it's really, these live events are great. I get to organize things. So it's this Bob's Red Mill, with the blue label, one-to-one -one gluten-free baking flour. And it is a mix of a number of flours. It's, this one is a mix of sweet rice flour, whole grain brown rice flour, potato starch, whole grain, sweet white sorghum, I love sorghum, and probably tapioca and xanthan gum. When you use a mix like this that's complete, you still wanna whisk it up. There is, we go, we do have a whole unit, of course, on gluten. This is not a gluten free course. There, I don't want to spill this all over myself or my table. Um, but you will definitely have to do some testing for gluten free recipes. Sometimes the flour mix is heavy, sometimes it's light. You will have to adjust the amount of liquid. You definitely need to add gums to this whether it's xanthan or guar or psyllium husk, because that's gonna help with the structure and usually more flavor as well. So yes, go ahead and give gluten-free baking a go. If you can get a mix like that, that's complete and it works. And I find that's pretty, it's almost one for one. If you're making your own mix and many people do, then you can go for it. Get to know which flours are gluten-free. You need to use some starch. There are two starch, two different starches in there. Um, but you can add some of your own based on if there are any other allergy situations. Sometimes there are. Um, Michelle says her children, your children and you all have celiac disease. So celiac is in a gluten sensitivity that is no gluten at all and sensitive to tree nuts too 
So healthy swaps, again, that Bob's Red Mill flour probably is good. You want to get some protein in there. Maybe you want to add a bean flour. And you can swap out some seeds for tree nuts. That's not much of a problem. You are looking for something that isn't going to change the texture or moistness of a recipe. You're going to have to do some testing, Michelle, because there are changes that are going to happen. Um, so I don't want anybody here to go away thinking, well, this isn't possible. It is absolutely possible. You just have to do a little bit of work. And again, we have different palates. So what might, you know, I was always able to taste gluten free. I don't know. I just was. There is a certain powdery aftertaste. I'm not tasting it so much anymore. I'm getting better at making gluten-free recipes. Certainly flour mixes like this are good. I add in some, I mean, this isn't going to work for Michelle because they're allergic to tree nuts, but think about adding some nut flours, almond flour, for example, or hazelnut flour. Oftentimes they enhance the flavor of a gluten-free cake or loaf or muffin, but nut flours have more fat. So that's going to be something that you, that's a positive or it can be a negative. So again, cut your recipes in half, keep really good notes, keep really good notes. Don't be, don't be like Fran. I just made some roasted figs. I bought some figs that sadly I love fresh figs that had very little taste. And um, I found a jar in my refrigerator unmarked. This is a big no-no. You want to label what an item is and the date that you bought it or made it. And all of my items are labeled and dated, but not this. So I opened it up. It smelled good. It looked good. It was sweet. It was a little bit pink. I have no idea what it is, really. I know it's edible. I know it was sweet. I know it was thick. And I will figure it out maybe after this live event. But I roasted the figs in it with a little balsamic and it was absolutely delicious. Christina wants to know which non dairy swap is the most universal to use in recipes, sweet and savory. Well, going back to the plant milks, I personally like oat milk. But, and you know, depending if you're making something really rich. And you don't mind in your want a coconut taste, maybe, you know, a coconut cookie or a coconutty red lentil stew. You might want to use coconut milk. I never, ever buy light canned coconut milk. I'm not paying for water. In that case, I will add amount of water to the coconut milk and make light. So any of the plant milks that appeal to you are good. We have vegan butter now, which is nice. When I started, oh my goodness, there was just hydrogenated stick margarine that I knew wasn't healthy, but it had an awful smell too. Before I finish answering the question about dairy, I want to say that when you're swapping butter for oil, you don't use the same amount. You use three quarters of the amount because oil is solid fat. Don't go crazy when I say the word fat, whereas dairy butter has some amount of milk solids in it. So you only need about three quarters of the amount. So that's something I wanted to tell you. Uh, other non-dairy swaps, we've got yogurts now. I make my own overnight in my Instant Pot. It's really, really cool. We've got yogurt. Um, I've been taking the cashew cream in my book and the one in the course and adding some probiotic powder to it and letting it sit. And then I get a nice creme fraiche or sour cream kind of a thing. So non-dairy swaps are really, really, really super. I have refrigerated ones and I have box ones and I made my I make my own too. So I hope that helps. Monica wants to know, how do you get nice, fluffy bakery style muffin domes? Well, my secret to getting muffins and cupcakes to dome is to bake them on a higher rack in the oven. This is not something you want with a cake. And I observed over time that cakes that were doming 
more than others were baked higher. I bake my cakes in the center of the oven and I have an ordinary oven for two reasons. One is because when you test recipes for people, you want something that's gonna work for everyone and not everyone has a fancy oven. Uh, and then I was going to get a big kitchen renovation, but that's on hold because of the pandemic. So I bake in a standard oven. It has a convection mode. I rarely use it, frankly. And we I teach in the course that I noticed that my cakes were doming more up high. So I bake in the top third of the oven and you get a nice dome, assuming that you've got a good recipe. Marina wants to know, are you using sugar substitutions? Um, I am not using sugar substitutions. I'm not using white cane, white sugar. I'm using organic cane sugar, coconut sugar, um, whole cane sugar. Those are basically the granulated sweeteners that I use for liquid sweeteners. I use pure maple syrup, grade A dark. I use sorghum syrup, which I love. I use that in place of molasses. I just prefer the taste and also date syrup, which is called also known as Ceylon in Middle Eastern stores, is also a molasses substitute. I know that there are people who are using stevia and the monk fruits and so on. I personally don't use them. So, and I, here's the thing. I want something that tastes really, really, really good that my system is going to recognize as a sweet. And the way I get around it is I serve a much smaller piece. So my truffles are smaller, my cake slices are smaller, my cupcakes are a little smaller, I fill out the plate with fruit, and your eye really thinks you're getting a bigger piece. Maria wants to know if I have a good pizza dough recipe that's vegan and gluten-free. I do not, but I can send you to Julie Hassan, H-A-S-S-O-N, and I am quite certain it's Julie's Kitchenette, might be the name of her blog spot, but you can find her online, Julie Hassan, and you can find her on Instagram, and I'm almost positive that she will have that for you. She's become a specialist in gluten-free baking. Oatly white package does not have the oil. That is the Oatly light milk. That's true. So that would work as well. Um, I use the one in the middle because I want it a little thicker. Uh, let's see. Araceli wants, can they recommend any ready to go whip toppings for cakes? Pastry pride is non dairy. I don't actually know that one because I don't really buy those things. I've tried a few and I don't like them. But if there's anybody here in this group who has an answer for Araceli, please let her know. I, I've seen. You know, the aerosol cans when I was a little girl, I don't remember which, Ready Whip. I think Ready Whip has a vegan one now. I make a coconut whipped cream in an ISI whip when I want that, but you'll find that in the market. Um, so Melissa says she's confused about the recommendations for which oils to use or she should opt for using no oils at all. You do use an oil, which is, if you use an oil, one of the healthiest. All right, so we were talking earlier about whole food, plant-based, no oil. So that is a strictly plant-based diet that doesn't have any oil in it. And Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Campbell, uh, there's a whole group of people that say this, and serious, you know, the science behind them, that this is very good for preventing and reversing heart disease. I absolutely trust these doctors. I do have some oil in my diet, limited amounts of oil. Uh, I think that, and they would disagree with what I'm going to say because they are against oils, but I use extra virgin olive oil when I'm using some oil. That's my oil of choice. I feel like it's the healthiest oil, but again, I'm using very little oil. I'm using some in my, some of my desserts, 
Some of my desserts are naturally oil-free. I mean, you can have a baked apple, you can have a poached pear. Truffles don't necessarily have to have any oil in them. So that's something that you can do. Um, Alma says, I'm fully vegan and love baking, hoping to do, well, I, hoping to do your course next year. I will be happy to welcome you when you have time. Uh, Sherry is asking if I grind the chia seeds. Absolutely, absolutely. Both chia and flax have to be ground. Now, if I'm putting some chia seeds into overnight oats, for example, I don't grind them. I'm not a big fan of chia puddings, so I know a lot of people like them. Again, this is personal. I don't like the texture, but I like a little bit in my overnight oats, for example. But when you're using it as an egg replacer, flax and chia have to be ground. I have a Cuisinart, a little nut seed grinder. I grind a bit at a time. I don't just stop to grind one tablespoon. I don't even think I could grind one tablespoon in that. It's not big, but I grind it, I label it, I date it, and I keep the ground seeds in my refrigerator ready to go. So that's really, really great. Okay, Natasha tried to make vegan cinnamon bread, but it, the outcome wasn't what she expected. She used a flax egg. And what do you recommend as an egg replacer with yeast recipes? You want a nice fluffy bread, don't we all? Well, if you use the flax egg and it didn't work, you've got to go back and figure out what will. Some of you may have heard of L'Artisan Bakery in Miami. It's a French bakery, fully vegan. If you haven't, look it up and be ready to be wowed. So Chef Carolina Molia, that's M-O-L-E-A, was somebody that I was mentoring years ago. She went through culinary school, she won all kinds of awards, and she opened this French bakery in Miami that is 100% vegan. You can actually buy her vegan croissant online and other products, and they are shipped. I know somebody in Alaska who's a graduate of the course just got a box. These croissants won Best of Miami in a blind tasting two years in a row. I mean, can you just imagine the French judges when they realized this was a vegan? The reason I'm bringing this up is that Carolina was one of my students. She went through Essential Vegan Desserts. I then became her student. We, you know, she assisted me in classes. So now I went down to Miami uh, last November and took her advanced vegan baking course because I love what she does. And again, there's always something to learn. In, so Carolina makes brioche. She makes croissant. I mean, brioche, right? She doesn't use just one egg replacer. In some recipes, she's using flax gel. So flax gel was the original aquafaba. If you boil flax seeds and then strain them, Miyoko has this in her book, Homemade Vegan Pantry. It's a little bit of a process. It's gooey but I make it and keep it in my freezer. She used that in some recipes. She used commercial egg replacer in others. She used flax gel in some. She used, you know, aquafaba in some. You have to find the one that works. So don't worry about it. Just, I mean, I approach this really as interesting work, not like, uh, I wouldn't go and test if I had to make something, if you have to have a birthday cake or you have to have muffins for a bake sale or something, this is not a time to test. This is a time to make something that you know is going to work. But then you think, well, what can I do to change it up? And that's what you can do. So Linda says, you have bookmarked vegan chocolate depression cake. Oh, thank you. So there's the link. Thank you for that, Linda. That's really great. So Carol Ann, oh, I have to finish up. This just flew by. Carol Ann wants to know what are the amazing looking small kitchen appliances in the background? Oh, <laughs> I can't really see the background, but I think what you're seeing in my kitchen, what I rely on, I think if you're looking over my shoulder, I'm getting ready to do a video, a pastry video. I use, I have a food processor. I have a Roboku, which is like 
It is to a blender what a Vitamix is to a blender. So it's commercial and it's really great. I have a big bowl lift KitchenAid mixer and a smaller one. Most of my cakes are done with the muffin method, dry in one bowl, liquid in another, and big whisks. And I mean, even when I go eight times. So I use my mix, I use my stand mixers to do other things. I like, I like um, my nut grinder, and I think you're seeing a big container of whisks. Can't have enough whisks, can't have enough bowls. But let's talk about whisks for a minute in the, in the last couple of minutes here. If you are making a, you're making something that you've got to really get a lot of air into it. You have to aerate the mixture. Think about whipping cream before we stopped whipping cream. You want a balloon whisk. You don't want a little skinny whisk. So having the right tools is really going to help you. We have a great list in the course of tools that we recommend. You don't have to have every single thing, but buy ones that are going to give you a head start. When you buy sheet pans, buy heavy ones that aren't going to warp in the oven, right? Buy a cake pan that's heavy enough or light enough, but doesn't have any jaggedy edges. Those are really important. Those are really important things. Um, Holly wants to know if I've ever tried beet or pumpkin flour powder. Well, I have some beet powder and I use it really to color things. I haven't seen pumpkin powder yet, so I can't say. I have time, I'm sorry, for just one more question. Um, if you partially substitute a nut flour in gluten-free or regular, is it one-to-one? Well, you're going to do a partial. So I, what did I do? Oh, the orange bun cake again. So here's a recipe that I really like, and it's really tested. So why would I go back in? Because one day I'm like, I wonder what would happen if I added a little bit of finely ground almond meal. And so I started with that recipe, I think takes three cups of flour. And I usually do 50% all purpose, 50% whole wheat pastry. You can always do 100% whole wheat pastry, add it up, or 100% AP. And I added probably a third of the amount of almond flour. So that's what I would suggest. And thank you all for being here. Thank you for your questions. I'm sorry I didn't get to them all, but we can talk about this again. You can always write to me at friend at ruby.com. And I'm wishing you all a great rest of the day or evening, wherever you are. Stay safe, be happy. And until I see you next month, I'm going to say goodbye now.